When I was in my late teens and had just been about a year driving, I wasn't one of those kids who immediately wanted to drive at 16. So I was, you know, I was about 19, I'd been driving for about a year, and I saw I was gonna take a legal right turn, and I saw a motorcyclist coming from a long way away, and I assessed the speed they were coming. I said, this is perfectly safe to take a right, and so I took that right, I know you're wondering how this is ever going to tie to what's going on here and me just not venting about a story. But took that right and it turned out I had misestimated how fast that motorcyclist was going. Now in that turn, I did not create a situation where that motorcyclist's life was at risk. It wasn't like this then all of a sudden almost hit me, but this guy was enraged. Enraged. He came right up behind me. I was like, look, my bad, I'm sorry. I you know, didn't realize. He's like, get out of the car, get out of the car. So I put my foot on the accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> foot on the accelerator. He got on the motorcycle, started following me. Different street, turn, different street. Boom, pull over. I pulled over. He's like, get out of the car. He comes in, bashing on my window, bashing on my window. And I, and I heard the key from his motorcycle, like hitting, which all of a sudden I realized, he doesn't have his key in the ignition. <laughs> Stepped on the accelerator again. <laughs> it's, it's amazing what can happen with road rage. It's amazing what can happen that can trigger our anger to such a place that it can get us in a dangerous situation and how many ways that anger does get us in a situation. Now, I have to admit, and now I'm gonna give you the other side because I have been on the other side of that exchange. I've been on the other side of that exchange. About 20 years ago, we were living in Coventry, and I was driving along the road, and someone kind of like came really hard up behind me and then like buzzed me on the side as they passed me, and that really ticked me off. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna show you, because I wasn't going slow in the left lane. Like this was like a single lane, like a you know, two-lane thing. And so we were going along, and we're doing this thing back and forth, and the guy's like, whoa, 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 and I'm like right on him. And then we get a stoplight, and his door opens. I'm like, uh-oh, because <laughs> you don't know these days. And so I said, I need to take a very aggressive posture here. And I turned my car. I wasn't going to hit the guy, but I turned my car and accelerated toward his front door as he was getting up. And the guy gets out. And it's one of my best friends. <laughs> and he's like, dude! And, I, and, I, and I, I am horrified. Horrified. Not that it's my friend. I'm grateful it's my friend. I want my friends to be able to see me vulnerable and not at my best place so they can help me become better. I was horrified at how I had gotten from where I was pleasantly going on to work to that stage that I was willing to aggressively turn my car towards the door as someone was getting out. Like I said, not that I was going to hit them. I wasn't going to hit them, but I was just trying to like make sure they stayed where they were and weren't getting out of their car. There's so many places. Has anybody here on one side or the other experienced road rage before from somebody? It could be you, it could be somebody else. Has anybody ever experienced being triggered by somebody else? Being triggered, and what I, right, right, being triggered. And what I mean by that is they say something or they do something and it, re, it, and it elicits a response that is disproportionately aggressive from the actual thing that came up in the first place. This is a place that we personally experience and have a lot of work that many of us have a lot of work to do, including myself, but it's also something that is a problem in the country right now, where little offenses become big, 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 like aggressive arguments and pursued and going after people and all of this kind of thing. And Jesus has some help for this because it is not easy to fix this. It is not easy to fix this. But things that are easy to fix often aren't all that worthwhile. They may be important, but sometimes the most important things that we have to fix in our bodies, in our spirits, in our souls, are the things that are difficult to fix. Because the easy stuff doesn't require God. The easy stuff doesn't require the Scripture's guidance. The easy stuff doesn't require the strength and inspiration of the Holy Spirit or the example 
of Jesus. The hard stuff does. So let's talk about that for a second, because what would Jesus say if we were in the middle of this? Because Jesus didn't have stop signs, right? Jesus didn't have these same kind of signs. But we're going to do this road rage, reducing road rage and anger, Jesus style, right? Jesus says, stop. Stop. Why is it important first to stop? What are we stopping? What are kind of things we can stop? And why is it important that we stop? One is when we're in the midst of this condition, in the midst of road rage, nothing positive is going to happen. I think at some point when someone's either right on you or you're in your moment of like being overwhelmed, you think that somehow one person's going to win and one person's going to lose. That somehow if you're the better driver and you can do something to show them up, that you're going to feel all better about this and then that anger's going to go away and it's all going to work out doesn't usually work out like that. It's like, oh, I'll pull into the parking lot and then I'll show him. Then what? You get into a fight? You either lose that fight or you win that fight and you end up in jail. Right? If you, if you bring all of these things all the way to the fruition of the logical conclusion of where they're going to go, there is no positive outcome in this. So we want to stop before we do something dangerous. We want to do stop because there is no logical positive end point to this type of behavior when our anger is triggered and we are kind of in a rage or something that takes over how our brain works in that moment. We also want to stop it because almost universally, I have felt, and my friends and other people I've talked to who have done this, feel worse afterwards. Like, it's not like they got this elation. It's like, oh, yeah, that was a wonderful experience. Let's go do that again right away. I don't know anybody who has had, and maybe you have, but I, don't know, I personally don't know anybody who has come away from that experience feeling that way. Another way, another reason that we need to start by stopping is because if we have dug ourselves in a hole that has led us to react in this way, what is the first thing you need to do? If you've dug yourself into a new hole and all of a sudden you realize you're deep into that hole, what is the first thing you need to do in order to begin to get out of the hole? You got to stop digging. You got to put the shovel down and you got to stop digging. So the first things we have to do is tell ourselves when we're in that moment, stop. Stop and listen. But listen to who? Listen to who? And this is where we get a lot of great guidance. In the first reading, the first reading comes from the letter of James. I think this is one of the most amazing letters in Scripture. And here's why. Anybody know who James is? James is the little brother of Jesus. Right? James is the little brother of Jesus. If you have ever been taught in another church or anywhere that Mary never had any other children, is perpetually a virgin, that is absolutely not true. The Bible again and again and again in the Gospels and the letters say that Mary had multiple children and one of the children was James, which is a younger brother to Jesus. Now, I don't know how your relationships are with your siblings, but when I die, I do not expect my younger brother to be writing a letter saying, everybody, this is how you should follow my brother from now on. Maybe some of yours will. But I think it's just exceptional and extraordinary that Jesus' brother is writing about following his older brother. I just think that, is, think that is remarkable. You must understand this, my beloved. And I imagine him saying it like this. You must, you must. He's not like, you must. Like, you must, like such passion. You must Learn this, my beloved, meaning always saying this out of caring, right? Always saying this out of caring and love for the other person. Let everyone be quick to listen, to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. But what are we listening to? Yes, we're listening to maybe for God's guidance, maybe for Jesus' guidance to say stop. But what we've also got to listen to is where is our ego playing in this? Listen to your ego. Is ego the thing that is driving you to cause 
to be so aggravated and triggered disproportionately that your anger comes flaming out after being triggered by a relatively small thing. Listen to your body saying, where is that pride coming from? Where is that depth of anger coming from that I need to work on my own stuff so that when that happens again, because it will happen again, because someone will trigger you, and it's probably the same person that has always triggered you if, you're, if they're still in your life. Or somebody cutting you off. Listen to those things so you can listen to your body and say, why am I responding that violently, that irrationally for my health to that situation? Right? It's like, be quick to listen, slow to speak. And he means like, don't yell out at the other person. Right? And don't do the verbal commands either. Right? <clears throat> so he's saying, why? Why? For, meaning because, for, because your anger does not produce God's dreams for you and God's dreams for the world, it doesn't give you peace. A lot of times you have a choice between being right and proving you are right and going after everything to show other people that you are right or to have peace. Now, I don't have that problem in my family because Lyndon knows that I'm right all the time. <laughs> so I get to be right and have peace. But not everybody else has that situation, right? So a lot of the times we have to decide, are we going to force this situation, insist and try to force that we are right? Or are we going to have peace? Listening to ourselves, what do you want? What is your desire? But I know this is not easy, that change is not easy, that doing these things is not easy. And I've got a question for you. Show of hands, how many people think that yield signs are yellow? Right? How many people think yield signs are yellow? Right? So studies show that about a third to 45% of the United States population still believes that, uh, that yield signs are yellow. Yield signs were made to this 50 years ago. 50 years ago. I was, in 1971 is when they changed these. Now, they didn't do them all across the nation all at once, so maybe you've had one for like 20 years, but there hasn't been one around for like, for like 20 years. I was three years old when they did this. I still, when I was asked this question 10 years ago in a survey, said they were yellow. Right? Certain things are ingrained in us. Certain things we're so used to that even when it changes and it's been changed for a long time ago, the opportunity is there, we're still ingrained, which is one of the reasons why change is hard. But the simple fact is, I haven't heard about a lot of you getting into crashes because you didn't see the yield sign because it wasn't yellow. Right? You still ended up seeing the yield sign that you went by, slowed down, and didn't have that accident. So congratulations, without even knowing it, you have adapted to this, made a change, and had things go well. Congratulations. Now imagine what you could do if you actually decided you wanted to be aware of your anger, your ego, your pride, and that you wanted to do something about it, knowing that those things that trigger you and bring out those reactions and bring out those things of anger that that degree of anger is disproportionate and is not entirely or mostly related to what that person did to you. What can you imagine is possible if we're able to make these adaptations without even being aware of it? What you can actually do if you decide you want to be aware of it, hold yourself accountable to doing it, and actually begin to try to do it. But what are the, some of the things that we need to yield. What are some of the things that we need to yield in order to have some of this greater peace, in order to have less of this anger? Part of this is we need to yield our ego. 
We need to yield our right to be right. We need to yield our desire to be angry. You can't help but being angry like when that's triggered in an emotion, but what you do with that after, you absolutely have a decision to make and control to do. So yielding our ego and our pride and our anger, but to who or to what? And that's what the Matthew passage gets to. And it says in the Gospel according to Matthew, verses 24 and 25, Jesus is talking here and it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, and I certainly hope that's who you are if you were here. I hope, it is my great hope, that all of you who are here want to be followers of Jesus, or if you are followers of Jesus, are trying to become deeper followers of Jesus in your journey. If you are looking for something else, there might be better churches for you. If you're looking for a place where you can be told that you are saved and you are in, and everybody who's not like you is out, there are lots of churches for this. This is a place we are trying to help you find. The path to walk with Jesus, the path to walk with God, the strength through the Holy Spirit, and the strength of community so that you can become closer followers of Jesus because that is how we are going to change hearts and that is how we are going to change the world for the better. But I digress. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose it for my sake, will gain it. This doesn't mean you give up everything about yourself. This doesn't mean that you give up all the freedoms and all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, what I want to do today is to have some fun. And Jesus is like, no fun for you today. You have to follow me. That's not what was going on here. Saying, give up some of the things Give up some of the things about yourself that are of no use, of no value, that are unhelpful. Yield your ego to me. Yield your pride to me. Yield your need to be right and your right to be right to me, and I will show you a way where, yes, you have given something up of yourself, where you have denied yourself the right to hold on to that ego as tightly as you can, that you have given up the right and you've denied yourself that desire to hold on to that anger, because if you hold on to that anger, then that other person is always going to be in trouble. Right? That you deny yourself the right to just already be right for something bigger, to let go of that life that is held on to always being triggered by things that are around you all the time. And instead, letting that go and taking up this other way, this other path that can bring you peace, that will bring you peace. So we always have choices. We always have choices. Do we want to stay exactly where we are? Or do we want to get better? Or when someone you know, does something to us and it really hurts and it triggers us, we have a choice. We can just say, oh, they're horrible. Okay, maybe they are. But what is it inside you that makes you respond in such a disproportionate way to do that that you can let go? Listen to this, my beloved. When you feel like this, stop and listen for where that is coming from and yield those things that are of no use to you in that moment to me, Jesus says. The old song goes, Jesus, take the wheel. It doesn't say ego and pride and anger and jealousy and everything else, take the wheel. Who do you want taking the wheel when you're in that moment? Because it is possible to stop that reaction. It is possible 
to yield these things of yourself and have a better life on the other end, and it is all accomplished through following Jesus. It is all accomplished through listening to his words and listening to his ways of putting down the things that are of no benefit to us, that if we do that, will open us up to be filled with something so much more wonderful, so much more beautiful, so much more setting our hearts at peace, which is a precondition to the peace that we aspire for in our families, in our country, in the Middle East, and in the world. And no, it's not easy, and Jesus never promises it's easy, because if it's easy, you don't need Jesus to help you do it. But if anybody is willing to do this, you have a community of faith, you have a pastor, you have a church, you have a place that's willing to work with you on that, and you just come by or give me a call or email me on that kind of thing that you're dealing with, and we will find a way, or if you're online, you just reach out to me, and we are going to find a way to work on this, because there are a few things that are more important than reducing anger in the world right now. So stop when that happens. Listen for where in your body that's coming from. Your body is trying to tell you something that you have to work on, not the jerk who cut you off. And then yield those things over to Jesus and let him let you become everything you have the potential to become. Follow him. It's not easy. But it works. I've seen so many people do this. I have never seen a single person not be better for doing it. If you do this, it works every single time. Follow me. It's not easy. But it works. Amen.